if you're like me, you come out of worship like that and, you know, you want to just keep going. <laughs> Amen. Um, talking about the name Jesus, what a beautiful name, what a powerful name it is. I mean, think about it from heaven's perspective. I know we, we just, we normally think about it from our perspective, but think about it from heaven's perspective as the angels know the power of his name. The, the angels know what has happened when his name has been used. And then you begin to understand the power and the beauty of, of his name. Um, let me jump into my assignment for today. Uh, have you ever had something end uh, in a way that you did not expect? I mean, maybe it was, uh, it was something that just jarred you, that was disappointing, or maybe it was something that happened that was good. I mean, I think, I think of Kobe and Shaq breaking up. I mean, you know, I, I think of the way Game of Thrones ended. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I think of the way Dune 2 ended. I think of the way The Sopranos ended. I mean, come on, Seinfeld, Friends. I mean, all of these places where you, you're not expecting the ending to be, to be that way. Well, if you've been with us the last couple months, you know we've been in a series walking through the Ten uh, Commandments. And uh, that's happened every Monday during our time in the Word. And the context of these commandments is one of freedom. And so we replace our striving and all of those kinds of things with our willingness to, to surrender. And we've covered the first nine, and my assignment today is to kind of close out this Decalogue uh, in, in a way that may be helpful for you. And this heart issue that we're going to focus on today uh, in Exodus 20, chapter 7, uh, helps us to understand some things that are very hard to understand. The enemy knows that rules without relationships lead to legal, legalism. And a life of legalism is basically checking all the boxes. But I want you to know and be reminded that we were made for so much more than that. Now, given the way the, the last four uh, commandments deal with this concrete idea, it's interesting that as we move into number 10, uh, it feels a little bit more abstract. It focuses on a word that we don't used very much in our culture today. Let, let's check it out. Uh, Exodus chapter 20 beginning, or we're just going to focus on verse 7 for right now. It says, you shall not covet, everybody shout covet, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, we can sum up coveting in a few words. It is wanting or taking something that does not belong to us. It starts in our hearts and our desires, and it can move quickly to our, our actions. Uh, I, I found that, like, sometimes we live with a scarcity mentality, that, that we don't have enough, that other people have more than we have, that they have more friends, that they have more money, that they have more resources. And this particular passage hones in on a heart issue that deals with something called fear and scarcity mentality. And my hope is that we begin to live out what we talk about in this entire series is this idea of freedom, that we, we want to move from covetedness, covetedness to being generous. Now, we're not able to unpack this totally, I think, with just this line. And so I, I begin to pray, like, what's, what's a passage, what's a parable, what's a story in Scripture, what's a narrative that could help us unpack some of the realities of this particular idea of coveting. Uh, we know that coveting uh, is connected to, to envy, is connected to fear, is connected to greed. And so what passage in scripture uh, should I focus on as I was praying? And I found that there's a passage in, in uh, ne Nehemiah chapter 5 that really helps us to understand some of what's happening in this text. So turn with me to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter five. We're gonna start at verse one. Now I'll give you a little bit of background as you're turning. Nehemiah is one of those narratives where we typically focus on him building the wall, 
right? We, we typically focus on him getting the people together, building the wall, reestablishing the security and the safety and the connectedness of the people to their God. But watch what it says here in verse one. It says, now, somebody shout now. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet, somebody shout, yet, we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Nehemiah says in verse six, when I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. So for a little while, I wanna to talk to you from the thought or from the subject, justice and generosity justice and generosity. Let's pray. Father, we know the flower fades, the grass withers, but your word stands forever. Speak into this moment, move me at the background. May you be at the forefront. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Speak now and give us the courage to respond in obedience. We pray this all in the matchless name of Jesus. Somebody shout amen. amen. So when we think about this idea of justice and generosity, it's that God calls his people to be generous as we lay down our rights in order to seek justice for others. Now, here are our working definitions for this message. Uh, first is justice. It is biblical advocacy that provides equity in regards to what is right or just for those being marginalized, mistreated, or oppressed. And then when we think about generosity, what we mean is a spirit and readiness that is willing to give more than is expected or more than what is required. Now, justice is one of those words that unfortunately has been hijacked by our culture. But biblical justice is what we see lived out here in our text that we're going to be in today. I love this chapter because it doesn't just deal with what's going on at the wall. It doesn't just deal with what's going on in the temple. It deals and addresses what, what's going on in people's homes and what's going on in people's hearts. It, it tells us that those things are as equally as important. Now, God is not concerned, not just concerned about our spiritual needs, but we see here that God is also concerned about our practical needs as well. How we serve the Lord and how we treat people all matter to God. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah is angry because he can't believe what is happening. And so it goes on in verse seven to say this. It says, I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and I said, and said, as far as possible, we have, we have been bought back from our fellow Jews. We have bought back our fellow Jews who were sold into, to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your own people only for them to be sold back to us. And they kept quiet because they could not find anything to say. So over the next few minutes, as I finish up this message, I'm really gonna talk about four things. Talk about high interest, and high interest is, is, is literally a, a framing of how we abuse or misuse power. We'll talk about a healthy fear of God, we'll talk about how high calling, and then we'll talk about heartfelt generosity. So let's start with, start with this idea of high interest. Everybody shout high interest. high interest. Now, why is Nehemiah so upset? I mean, we got check cashing stores, we got banks that, uh, and credit cards that have exorbitant amount of interest rates. I mean, that's normal uh, for us and our, and if people choose to get a credit card, if, if they choose uh, to use a check cashing store, then I mean, that's, that's on them, right? <laughs> 
But watch what's going on here in the context. Those who were working on the wall could not adequately take care of their homes and their fields. They typically ate what they grew. They were an agrarian culture. But because people were away from their fields and working on the wall and not their crops, there was little to no food for their families. In an effort to put food on the table and keep their heads above water, they mortgaged off their fields. They had to borrow money to pay the taxes on the fields they no longer owned. And debt was accumulating. And we know, all know like how, how debt can be oppressive. I mean, it, it affects not just our finances, but it affects every other area of our lives. And their wives and their families were crying out for help. Not only that, but there is actually a passage, watch this, there's a passage in Leviticus that addresses this very issue, and they would all have known about this passage. Watch what it says in Leviticus 25, beginning at verse 35. It says, if any of our fellow Israelites become poor and are unable to support themselves among you, help them as if you would a foreigner or stranger so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that they may continue to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. I found that power, power can typically help or it can hurt people. It's rarely neutral. We've all have, uh, we all have been given some type of power, some type of influence, whether it's at, at work or at home or at school or at church or in our communities, where, where, we, where we have the ability to speak into something, to leverage something, to give access to some, someone else. Some, sometimes it's just simply like you being the older sibling in your family and you have a little bit more power and authority to leverage things. Sometimes we abuse that power. Sometimes our high interest is, is, is not uh, uh, that for us. Sometimes it's our words. Uh, sometimes it's how we use our time. I, I'll never forget when um, God convicted me. Like I, I started working when I was nine, nine years old. I was working in tobacco fields uh, as a tractor driver and eventually I became a cropper. Uh, and so from nine, year old, nine years old until now, I've always been someone who has held like three to four jobs. I, I, I just believed in working and having multiple streams of income. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I'll never forget when God convicted me and he let me know that I had been spending so much time trying to provide for my family that I had missed the, that one of the more essential things of being with my family is spending time with them. Are you with me? And that I had, I had des decided that it was more important to make money than it was to spend time. It was convicting. It was one of those moments where God had to show me something that I didn't, I didn't really realize before. And here's what's happening in this text. God is showing these people something that they didn't really see before. They were lining their pockets and Nehemiah was outraged by that corruption and by the exploitation of his own people. And he responds to this injustice by bravely confronting the leaders and being an example of what justice looks like. Now, sometimes you are going to have to confront other people in love who are abusing some part of their power, some part of their platform, and to remind them of what God has spoken over us and God, what God has spoken into us. It is one of the more difficult things I've ever found in my life to confront a family member, to confront a boss, to confront the church. Are y'all with me? I'll never forget, um, th there's this situation that happened in my home and two of my kids were fighting. Not literally fighting, but they were fighting, you know. And one of the kids, I overheard them from the other room, one of the other kids was being really mean to the other child. And the child said it, it was like, you are, you are being really mean. And so I walked into the room and I see this going on, I stop him and I look at the child that's being really mean and I said, look, like what you just did was really mean. And that child said, I'm not a mean person. Are you saying I'm a mean person? And I'm like, nah, don't, don't get defensive about this. I'm not saying you're a mean person. What I'm saying is what you did in that moment was really mean. And sometimes what we do sometimes is we fight against this idea that we're a certain kind of person because we have been confronted and there's some conviction. And we say to people, I'm not, I'm not that. I'm not sexist. 
I'm not racist. I'm not homophobic. And what we have in that moment sometimes is we're not, people are not saying we're that. They're saying what you just did was very sexist. What you just did was very racist. What you just did was very homophobic. What you just did was an abuse of your power. And you need to be confronted. I know it's quiet in here. I can hear a pin drop. Because sometimes the Holy Spirit comes when other people don't really see all of the things that are going on in your heart and your mind. The Holy Spirit comes and confronts you and lets you know that the space that you're in, the way you're thinking, the, the desire to take from other people so that you can have more, uh, the desire to, to abuse your power so that you can have more, that, that that might be something wrong with that picture. And so he pulls them together and he confronts them in love. Now here's what I've learned as a follower of Jesus. We can love God and we can miss the mark sometimes. We, we can love God and we can make mistakes sometimes. We can love God, watch this, and we can mistreat people sometimes. Just because you have done something bad does not make you a bad person, but we have to admit when we've crossed that line. What do you do when these types of things are brought to our attention? Are we defensive? Do we pass the blame? Do we live in shame? Or are we willing to learn and grow? Let's see what happens next in this text at verse 9. It says, so I continue. This is Nehemiah talking. What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let's stop charging interest. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them, 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We see here in this text that justice, justice seems to be connected to generosity. That it's actually part of God's character. And that if it's part of God's character, then it should be evident in our lives as image bearers of Christ. The church needs to be, watch this, say, say this with me. The church needs to be prophetic. Somebody shout prophetic. We need to have a prophetic voice for justice and the issues in our world and not an apathetic one. This leads to my second point. We see in this text that this high interest and the conviction of the confrontation is partially the approach that Nehemiah makes to address a healthy fear of God. Now, I have a healthy fear of some things. One of the things I have a healthy fear of is my wife. Come on, say amen, somebody. <laughs> Wait till you get married, brothers. You, you have a healthy fear. Like when I, I watched her deliver children in an operating room, I, I, I have a healthy fear of what that woman is capable of. Come on, somebody. Like sometimes my wife speaks and I literally feel like I hear the voice of God. I have a healthy, healthy fear of my wife. I, have a healthy, I had a healthy fear of my football coach. Um, when I'm traveling, I have, a, I have a healthy fear of spicy food. Come on, say amen, somebody. Don't, don't do it when you're traveling. Nehemiah says to the people that they should stop what they're doing in part because of their healthy fear of God. This, this is what we call reverent fear. This is a, a deep respect for God. He wants them to see their brothers and their sisters as being made in the image of God. In so doing, watch this, we would be wise to not mistreat God's people. And so Nehemiah challenges them to put an end to their unfair interest rates. He proposes land for reform and giving farmers the ability to own the fields that they've worked. Now the question becomes, how are these people going to respond? Watch what it says in verse 12. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, in this way, may God shake out their house and possessions. Anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and emptied. At this, watch this, at this, the whole assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Wow. Wow. They moved from greed 
and injustice to generosity because they feared the Lord. Nehemiah told those in power to give back the land and all the money and the resources they took. And the people in power agreed. They swore a public oath. And verse 13 tells us that they did as they had promised. Now, while their repentance was costly, they followed through on their word and the oppression was brought to an end. Their response shows that for justice to be accomplished, watch this, for justice to be accomplished, our words and our actions must be aligned. Let me say that again. For justice to be accomplished, our words and our actions must be aligned. Are you just saying it or are you doing it? That leads to something interesting that Nehemiah shares the latter portion of this chapter. Now, I may not read all of this because of time, but I'm gonna paraphrase what happens from verses 14 to 19. Basically, Nehemiah says, I've had an opportunity to line my own pockets. I've had an opportunity to have the choice food and the choice resources in the position that I'm in, but I've chosen not to because of the burden it would place on the people and because of my healthy fear of God. And what I'm suggesting to you is that this should be a lifestyle and not just one act. Y'all catch that? And so in my third point to you is this idea of high calling. I, I never will forget like one of the first times I helped someone plant a church uh, it was a guy that I had, he, I mean, he was someone that I looked up to. He, uh, his messages, I mean, the way he preached, I mean, the way he uh, unpacked scripture just blew my mind. And because I'm someone that loves great teaching, I, I followed him and helped him plant a church. But then I realized this very gifted speaker and orator of God's word had some character flaws. And one of his character flaws was how he used money. And what I found over a period of time as someone who's very close to him and someone who was a part of the kind of inner workings of the church is that he thought more of himself than he did of the ministry. And he decided to hoard the things and the resources of the church for himself instead of pouring it back into the ministry. And it was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do was to sit across the dinner table from him and to confront him in love ask the question, what about our high calling? What about our role in leading others that sometimes we want to covet, we, we, we desire, we wanna take things that really don't belong to us and, and God will convict us hopefully and cause us to see our own uh, selfishness and our own greed and move us from a place of covetousness to a place of generosity. With great power comes great responsibility. And in verse 14, we see that Nehemiah has given power uh, is given power by the king of Persia to govern the Israelites. And ultimately we know that God is the one who gives the authority and the responsibility. And while we may not be a government official, we all have a sphere of influence we are responsible for. And our sphere of influence may be at home, it may be here at school, it may be in our faith community. And then in verse 15, we see Nehemiah's reasoning for not taking what was entitled to him. He feared God. He didn't just challenge others to have a healthy respect of God. He lived it himself. And that leads to our last point. And that is heartfelt generosity. This is where we land the plane today. Remember, we defined generosity earlier as a spirit and readiness that is willing to give more than is expected or required. Nehemiah's heartfelt generosity encourages us to lay down our rights and our, and our privileges and make sacrifices so that we can help others. We can make our sacrifices in ways like giving of our time, giving of our talent, giving of our resources, giving of our platform. And sometimes that will pull us out of our comfort zone because we should have a posture of learning and giving and helping others to thrive. So this is where I wanna close with my message, this story. Some of you were able to be at Follow uh, in December. And in preparation for Follow, uh, there were people like Jim Lowe uh, uh, here, Dr. Jim Lowe. There were people like Charlie Alcock. There were uh, many of your um, 
students who came and supported us. But I'll, I'll never forget, I was preparing for follow. And traditionally what happens if you're the director of Next Gen or the youth director of the convention is you usually have that fourth slot as the slot to preach about calling. And as I prepared for that message, and usually the person preaches and there's a response. And as I was praying, I also found out that there had never been a, a woman who had led the calling time. And I said to myself, as I was in prayer, that's gonna change in 2023. So I began to pray about, well, who's gonna be the woman? Who, who's gonna be the woman that I invite to close out this session of calling? And the person's name that kept coming up over and over was Olivia Williamson. Some of you know her because she graduated from here a few years ago. And so I invited Olivia, I called her, I'll never forget that day on the phone with her, I said, Olivia, like, I, I can't explain to you why I think this is so important fully, but I, I want to invite you to, to lead the calling segment of follow. I'm going to set you up, and I want you to close out the message. And, and in that moment, as I look back on it now, it's one of the most powerful moments for me of follow 2023. And, and, and not because of anything I did, but because there was this moment where I realized that maybe, maybe my platform, maybe the power and the authority I have been given is not for me to hoard it for myself. It's not for me to, to use for my own advantage, but it's actually for me to give it away. It's for me to give it away. And, and the having this scarcity mentality and, and this fear of not having enough, not, not having enough net platform, not having enough followers, not having enough people to invite me to speak, that all of that stuff needs to be thrown out of the window. And I need to be generous with the platform and the power that I've been given. And so I said to Olivia, I want you, I want you to do what I would normally do. Because I believe there's something about being generous and giving away power giving away privilege, giving away position, if it's gonna help. And so that's what I did. My challenge to you is this, as Andrew comes and closes us out, are you willing to move from covetousness to the freedom that comes with generosity? Are you willing to leverage what you've been given to bless someone.